Okay, good morning. Let's, uh, let's kick this off. So a big welcome to already our fifth edition of, of Brucon, which originally was started in Brussels, hence the name Brucon, but we're not going to change it to Gekon, just too big. You understand that. Um, I have a couple of practical uh, slides for you. So here you are in the room West Vlatern. So you'll notice that we've called our rooms after Trappist beers. Okay. So each time when you enter one of these rooms, you have to drink one. But not in the room, in the lounge. So the lounge is out there. And there's three other rooms, workshop rooms in another building beside the West Vlatern. The West Vlatern is just next to this room, where the main workshops are this afternoon. And three other rooms are in Novotel, which is a five minute walk from here. Um, and there's three uh, rooms there. Now these rooms can take 30 people. And there is no online registration system for there, so it's on, based on a first come first serve basis. A couple of these workshops will be repeated, so if you miss one, you can, you can try it again next time. Um, a couple of other practical things. Uh, this, uh, in the brochure, there is uh, details how to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, we only have limited Wi-Fi, so don't hack it and don't, like, use torrents or video streaming or whatever on it so that we can all enjoy it. Um, T-shirts are going to be sold as of uh, the first break uh, at the reception. And there is going to be streaming of the event as well, but the stream will not be accessible here in uh, the, the building because of the bandwidth. One important thing, uh, who of you has, has drinks here? Okay. Um, don't, don't bring drinks and food in this room. Um, the, the university is really picky about keeping this room in the state it is. We had remarks last year, so please don't bring any drinks and food in this, in this area. Okay. Now, a couple of program updates. So we originally, ha originally had Justin Eitel as keynote. He couldn't make it, uh, but we're very happy to have Amelie Andersdotter replacing him uh, just after these uh, few words. And we have David Mortman this afternoon uh, or evening as a second keynote today, uh, replacing Aaron Fenix. Now, the schedule will always be updated. Uh, it's online, sched.brucon.org. Um, these are all also mentioned in here together with the QR codes that are on the slides. So this will be streamed. So for people that cannot join here, inform them, Twitter this, uh, this URL so that people outside uh, the, the event can also enjoy it. Now, for you who don't know it, this, we've started this as a non-profit organization. Uh, this is all run by volunteers. Nobody's being paid for this. Um, but we did, a lot, we did a good job last year in the sense that we made a profit. And that's, that's, a, that's a problem for a non-profit organization. No? You have to spend it on something. So what we've done is we've donated uh, money to projects in open source area and that align with our mission. So there's three projects which you can see here which have received money and we're going to repeat this this year again and we're also for instance sponsoring other events like this year uh, OM in the Netherlands was sponsored by Brucon as well. Now one of the things which makes it possible to organize this and to keep the tickets low is the, is the sponsoring. Um, there's a couple of sponsors outside um, please visit them, give them some love. Uh, it's, they're here to keep our ticket prices low. So a big thank you to the diamond sponsors, the gold sponsors, the party sponsor, IOActive, for this evening, and the others helping this uh, event coming uh, together. Already talked about it a little bit. We have a party this evening uh, as of 9.30. It is also mentioned in the book where the, the location where it is. It's also not very far. Um, it's in the Cirque Central, and there is going to be uh, some really awesome DJs playing there. So it's highly recommended if you can make that. Now, if you want to volunteer and help us organizing this, there's a volunteer mailing list uh, which you can join, um, and we'll be posting regular updates on there as well for this year or next year. But most importantly, enjoy this conference, have fun. Um, Basically, enjoy it. And after you've done it, let us hear how you find it. Uh, we, we have uh, some online feedback forms. 
uh, which you can fill in. Uh, this is the URL or the QR code. Um, and let us know how you will find it and we can improve it with your feedback. Okay. So I will now give the word to Amelia, Anders' daughter, our first keynote. Give her a big applause. Yes. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Amelia Andersdotter. I'm an elected member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party from Sweden. That is very echoey. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been wanting to speak to you today about the electronic identification regulation, which was proposed by the European Commission in 2012, uh, in July. Uh, so I've been working with this in the European Parliament for the last year, and it's actually in many ways a very good illustration of many of the um, big questions that are facing society right now about society, uh, uh, facing society about the internet, identity, surveillance, privacy, security, and how these things relate to individuals and their society. So first of all, what does the regulation aim to do? The regulation aims to give people in different member states a way of accessing e-government services in other European countries. So um, this is the Belgian tax authority, and you can log in with your EID card to pay your taxes. And so um, um, when a specific e-government service in a member state requires some type of authentication, this regulation means to make it possible for a citizen for a member state B, for instance, to go to member state A and say, I want to authenticate myself with my member state B certificate. So the problem is that over the last 15 or 20 years, member states have chosen many different ways of issuing electronic identification. Um, uh, another problem is that there's a general perception that uh, electronic identification hasn't been very successfully implemented or adopted by citizens, consumers, businesses, and so forth. So um, rather than using government-issued identification on the internet, citizens feel more comfortable relying on their Facebook login, or um, in many cases, actually, citizens will create different logins for different services. Probably a lot of you have accounts on different types of social media that pass off as your identities from time to time. So there's been some pushes towards stuff like OpenID. Uh, but OpenID doesn't fulfill the requirements that a government would have to put. Uh, on its own services, so if you're going to use the tax authority, for instance, it's clear that OpenID doesn't provide you with sufficient security. Um, and this is the same thing with healthcare things, that normally you want a stronger type of authentication that the current systems um, provide. So, um, um, but electronic identification is also something that we expect companies to use. And the European Union has presently been making procurement on the internet mandatory, so everyone who wants to sell a service to a public institution would have to um, use some kind of authentication to access the e-procurement system. Um, and with that being about 25%, I think, of European GDP, um, it makes it very urgent for us to have strong and uh, very, like, verifiable ways of ensuring that a public authority is, in fact, in contact with the right entrepreneur. Otherwise, you could end up um, wasting a lot of money. So these solutions often rely on certificates or cryptographic certificates, uh, and therefore the Commission has also aimed to regulate what they call trusted service providers. These trusted service providers would be more known for many of you as certificate authorities, um, but uh, many member states rely on what they call uh, on what they call qualified trusted service providers, and so are qualified like somebody who fulfills a specific requirement. Um, in practice, the qualification just means that the member state recognizes that the qualified certificate is secure and reliable in a given transaction with the government. Um, the rules for how to qualify certificates are derived from European Directive from 1999, um, but it was never really used in all of the member states. And so, for instance, in Sweden, we've never relied on qualified certificates, and instead we used just normal certificates. The fact that there's this discrepancy between the commission terminology, that they say that this is a trusted service provider, and normally in technical terms you would talk about certificate authorities like the CAs, 
meant a bit of a problem for us in the parliament because it meant that a lot of the technical discussions around the problems of CAs weren't accessible to us because they were described in a language that we didn't understand. And so I think the commission could have done a better job on proposing that. The qualified certificate authorities in member states have also suffered a number of problems over the years, so the rules from 1999 are not very good. The Didinotar failure in the Netherlands is probably the most notable example, and it's clearly inconvenient for the uh, government when something like a Didinotar failure happens. And so uh, in this proposal, we tried to fix um, interoperability between different member state solutions for electronic identification, and to fix the problem that sometimes um, we have vulnerable CAs um, and the fact that we don't know what to do when a CA fails. Um, the regulation was proposed more or less in, in two different parts. So the first part covers the electronic identification and the second part covers the uh, trust service providers or certificate authorities. Um, there are about 20 articles which only set up criteria for what should be considered secure. Um, and so um, uh, we envisage, of course, that this will boost the European Union into the future, uh, and it remains to be seen. So uh, the problem is that electronic identification is also kind of a touchy subject for many member states. Um, in some member states, like in Ireland or Great Britain, government-issued ID cards is like the most controversial thing. Every time it's proposed, the population completely um, riots and um, the government has been unsuccessful in implementing a central register. In other member states, like in Germany or many Central European countries, they have constitutions which require a very strict separation of various forms of citizen identities with respect to the government. And so um, you will have a healthcare persona or a tax authority persona, and essentially the government is banned from linking these different personas together. Um, the idea is that, of course, if the government in these countries would be able to collect too much information on every citizen interaction with the government, um, that could lead to very negative consequences for the citizen, uh, especially if you um, end up with a government that doesn't want the best for the people. Uh, in my member state, Sweden, and in many other member states like Estonia or Finland, we have a, a national number that is unique uh, for every individual and that helps the government cross-run databases if it wants to. Um, in at least Sweden, this used to be uh, not so easy to do, like cross-running the databases, but of course with information technologies being deployed in every part of society now, it's much more simple to get a very all-encompassing view of how every citizen interacts with their government at every turn. And so we've had a lot of criticism in Sweden the last few years about um, whether the national number is necessary, but we have yet to see it removed. The European Commission's proposal strangely avoided most of the controversies with the different member state approaches to identification. Um, it was um, largely a roadmap on how to make different types of electronic stamps, signatures. Um, the, uh, uh, the, idea, yeah, the idea is to um, uh, basically tell public authorities in member states what they have to consider truthful or verified. Um, this led to much confusion in the European Parliament both on the identity, I said already on the trust service part, but also uh, we are not a technical institution, but a political institution. And so we cannot consider ourselves the best agents to make technical decisions for what is true and genuine or what is not true and genuine in technical terms. It's even a fact that many different member states use different systems for establishing what is true or genuine. So with different backgrounds of members of the European Parliament, um, we had problems seeing why this file would be um, at all interesting from either a political or technical perspective. Essentially, the commission had made it too technical and they avoided the political issues that could actually be interesting to discuss in the context of, of this file. Um, but it turned out later that the European Union has sponsored a lot of research programs about why this file could be interesting, actually also from a political perspective, and so some of the researchers that the European Commission had previously given money um, came to us in the Parliament to express their point of view. So the first thing is like, identity is a very philosophical concept. Who am I? Um, what are we? What is 
Europe, and many people spend their entire life pondering these issues, and, and most of us never reach satisfactory answers. So um, we also have the issue of like, what is my identity in relationship to the government? What does it mean that you have a healthcare persona with respect to the German government that cannot be connected with your uh, police records or your tax records? What, what are all of these identities? How do you deal with them? And this is where the different approaches of the different member states um, with many different cultural backgrounds and histories of governan governance and governments um, gives us many different answers. Like what is the appropriate relationship to establish between a personal identity and, and a government? Um, it's a question that the European Commission had hoped to avoid by introducing an interoperability framework for the various member state solutions so that everyone could keep their own solution and their own answers while at the same time allowing their citizens to interact with the public services of other member states. Um, but the European Commission sponsored much research in this field over the last few years, including flagship programs like really ambitious studies of what do information um, what do information technologies mean? One of them is, is Fidis.net, and I actually very much recommend some of their results. It's future of identity in the information society. And the people that I spoke to in October or November last year uh, would be from um, ABC for Trust or attribution-based credentials for trust. How do you build a trustworthy uh, authentication and identification systems in digital environments? Um, and I understood on hearing the explanation of these research programs that the Commission had actually rather cautiously decided to discard most of the major investments that they themselves had made in figuring out how to make these authentication services work for citizens in a privacy-friendly way. And that is a bit stupid because actually privacy is um, uh, something where we have made a lot of investments and where we could get a lot of market advantages also. So the problem for in governments is that we're forced to interact with them in a number of circumstances. We can't help but providing lots of information about ourselves, our families, our wage situation, and housing for, to the tax office. The tax authorities need that information. And, and um, uh, so, but it's a lot of information about us as persons, and which if, which, if it is arbitrarily spread around, can lead to very negative consequences for us in our working life with our friends, family, schools, and other things. So we generally expect confidentiality of some sort from our tax authorities. It's the same thing with health or dental care services. We more or less have to interact with these public services, at least until we're legally adult. Schools, social services, the job center, the government forces us to interact with them in any number of ways that we can't choose not to. And so, because that is a forced interaction that we can't escape, you would imagine that politically we would want to think very carefully about how these interactions are set up. Um, the government will normally run all of these services and the general privacy friendly idea is that because it's now so easy to cross run databases and cross reference databases, the interactions need to be unlinkable. So the German constitutional idea basically that you can't take a database from one service, cross references with another service so that you get a view of how your um, income uh, is related to your health record, for instance. Um, it should not be possible to find out that you, the citizen, in the same day has ordered a chlamydia test on a public health service website and then filled in your tax returns or requested a building permit. Um, the idea of unlinkability is, is very strong in the German constitution. So in Germany, it's mandated by a constitution that public authorities don't cross-run or profile their own citizens based on the totality of their interactions. Uh, and so uh, unlinkability in this case means that um, you stop one party, which is very powerful, from getting too much information, therefore too much power over another party, which is very weak. And in Germany, the way they implemented EID, they were very strict about enforcing the unlinkability principle because it's, it's a very strong principle in Germany that is partially derived from their experiences in the Second World War. In, in Sweden, we rather have many specialized laws for government registers where we restrict the ability of a public authority to cross-run databases with another public authority or service. Um, the national numbers that we give to every resident in the country makes it, of course, possible to cross-run the databases anyway, should we need to. Um, but we expect for public authorities to follow the law, and we don't particularly stringently 
um, implement this technologically. So the idea that one could want in some cases to have unlinkability exists. Uh, but we're not, we're not using a technical construction to actually enforce this uh, to, or to live up to the spirit of the law, as it were. Um, also because apparently public authorities in Sweden frequently sell data about citizens to private companies, um, one could imagine that actually the aggregation of all of the interactions happen with some, uh, happens now with some private party rather than with the public authorities themselves. Um, the Swedish system has some flaws which uh, um, also are amusing that I will talk more about maybe. But the EU research projects had made a different insight also. So in order to reduce the size of databases and therefore reduce the harm of security breaches or data leaks and protect the privacy of users and the confidentiality of interactions, one could use something called anonymous authentication or attribution-based credentials. This is when you only provide the information necessary for a specific purpose to identify yourself. If it was needed for me to demonstrate that I am legally allowed to buy tobacco products, I would demonstrate that I am in fact not born in 1995 or later than 1995, rather than demonstrating that I am born on August 30th, 1987. The resulting data trail from that type of authentication would be information about someone born before 1995 used this service, rather than uh, Amelia Andersdottir, 1987 or 830, has used this service. So uh, uh, while in the first case it's rel relatively difficult, even after a data, data leak, to link the use of the service back to me as a person, in the second case it is nearly inevitable that if there is a data leak, somebody will know that it was exactly me that used that service. And so this is quite privacy friendly. Um, to me at, at this time, it seemed, because this was like November 2012, it, it had seemed to me very stupid that the Commission disregarded the wisdom of their own research programs, um, and that we further were not considering the institutional effects of the law proposal we had before us. When you make an electronic identification system, you are determining the interactions between a citizen and the government, and it seems to me that you should think a bit about how these interactions work, and we hadn't done that. And so, of course, I'm quite privacy-minded, and I believe that the preservation of privacy is an essential aspect of maintaining a good power balance between individuals, groups, governments, and companies. Um, so I wanted politically to advance the idea of unlinkability and attribution-based credentials. When the problem is that I had this kind of long and messy and seemingly very technical file that made very little sense. Um, 20 arguments, 20 articles, out of 40 only establishing various random security criteria that I have no competence or skill to evaluate. Um, this was a problem for me. So for those of you who don't know how the European Parliament works, we are allowed to go in and, and change texts that the Commission propose, proposes. So even when we have a text which looks seemingly messy and large, we can actually ourselves amend that text uh, until we're satisfied with it. Um, but it's very challenging to write a good technical regulation. Actually, all legislation is quite difficult to, to write because you need to make compromises and you need to think about the texts. And so oh. the European Parliament normally wouldn't change too much in a proposal by the European Commission because it's difficult to do so and get a majority to follow you in these uh, things. So normally we do semantic changes, like you will change your word from may to shall or um, uh, put in the word adequate or when reasonably expected, this type of thing, rather than do a complete overhaul of the general political direction that the Commission establishes. And so I was in a situation where I wanted to completely break off with the Commission line, and that was uh, uh, very challenging. So at the same time that I was working, no, this is not, yeah, whatever. You will have to watch this slide a bit longer, sorry. So at, at the same time that I was working on this in the European Parliament, I was looking for a lot of information about different systems in member states. An Austrian colleague from the Parliament helped me find out about the Austrian EID. Um, that was normally seen as unsuccessful in Sweden because only about 10% of all Austrians apparently have the EID card. Um, and uh, there's no real service market around it, so you won't find private actors using the Austrian EID, only government services do clearly not a boost for the economy as perhaps was intended. Um, it's based on smart cards. Um, the same thing in Germany, they have a strong smart card industry, I guess also 
uh, in France, they would have a strong smart card industry. I was lobbied by them. Um, in Sweden, they had worked really hard for several years to put up um, a SAML, SAML, S-A-M-L, um, Identity Federation, so, which could replace other forms of e-authentication online that we had used. So in Sweden, we had bank IDs for a long time, and now some people had thought that we would make a different type of authentication online. A friend of mine in Sweden contacted me about that issue and said that this is upsetting because uh, some of two identity federations uh, keep track of who the user interacts with, and so the unlinkability of your transactions with the government isn't preserved at all. And that is the slide. And so um, basically what happens, or the critique that I was presented with is that um, you have to tell your identity provider who you're going to meet. And that means that the identity provider gets a big database which covers all of your interactions with the public authorities. And so if you visited the tax offices and then the health services and then the um, whatever other, the job center, whatever public services you're, you're with, the identity provider will know. If you ordered the chlamydia test and you accessed your school at the same day, and these could be authentic Swedish examples, mine, like you're actually able to do these things online in, in Sweden with e-authentication. And in the SAML Identity Federation, the identity provider would have that database and, and know about it. Um, I'm a bit upset about this uh, because I think that the decision to use this particular technical standard in Sweden is, is derived from uh, either complete idiocy or lack of attention or both. Um, it's obvious that most citizens will not like for there to be an, because the identity provider is a server. There's an IT guy somewhere behind this server, and they will know because they will have access to the database. And I think most citizens, when they go to their government services, they're not going to feel comfortable knowing that there's someone somewhere who's able to trace everything they do with the government. Uh, Swedish municipalities and regions were not so happy about the government's decision to implement the system uh, because they felt that it undermined their ability to provide trustworthy services to their citizens. Since they are not in control over the identity provider, they felt that they couldn't guarantee to their citizens that this was a system that was um, uh, reliable and, and trustworthy. And municipalities and regions deal a lot with citizens in their day-to-day -day affairs. So they, they have to have a system that they can trust and that the citizens can trust and where you can build kind of a, a good local environment for, for everyone to deal with. And Sweden had investigated the topic of this identity federation for some three or four years before they made the decision. And nowhere in four years and thousands of pages of text do they envisage how, that how the authentication works may affect how it is perceived. Um, apparently the reason for this is twofold. First, there is some person in Sweden who is a um, technical guy and runs an identity federation at the university. He is very good at managing this identity federation. He likes it a lot. He's very good at managing it. His university is using it in a good way. And so when the government found itself in need of, an, of some new e-authentication opportunity, he thought, this system which works at my university so well and that I can take care of in a good way must surely also be a good system to operate the nation state. But the state then, uh, its public services uh, at every level of governance from municipal to um, national and governmental is a very different place from university. They're not the same. And so there's nothing that says that a system that works in one of these places also works um, at, a, at the national level. And I can understand if, if you're an IT guy at the university, why you wouldn't think about that. But over, over four years of investigations, you would have thought that somebody in the government would have thought about that, because they have political sciences and other people that think a lot about the institutions, one would hope. So that is, that is very worrying, that nobody noticed this. Um, the national number in Sweden, uh, which I mentioned, uh, and which makes linkability very easy, has been controversial for many years, and so um, a lot of people want it gone. And so I had this email in the spring from one of the techie people that liked this identity federation, which say that, yeah, but you know, we're actually a very privacy friendly solution, even though we have this like tracking function built into our federation, because in the certificates, the national number will no longer be there. Um, 
But the thing is, either you have a number which allows you to connect all of the databases, or you have an IT guy who keeps track of all of the databases. So actually, they just replaced kind of the national number with themselves, and uh, that, that took me like four months to figure out that the, that's the fundamental flaw of them, that they consider themselves trustworthy, which is normal and acceptable, but then they also consider that everyone else will do that also. Um, so, um, in general, the Swedish system has given me some big pains. Another time, I woke up early in the morning because of this system, and I realized that somebody had told me when we were meeting over a breakfast meeting that the reason that we have this identity federation in Sweden is because the military supported it. And so this is a tracking system for all of the citizens' interactions with the government. And I wake up in May, in the middle of the morning, and I go, the military wanted the tracking system for all of the citizens' interactions with the government. Why did the military want that? Um, so um, uh, some people I knew that wanted to become part of this new tracking federation because they were upset about the tracking and they wanted to find a way to hack the system and make it useless so that it would go away. Um, in that particular case I had a minor existential crisis because um, the nature of decision making has been studied for a long time and, and in this case they wanted to join the identity federation so that they could become a good tracker. Um, Max Weber, a German political scientist from sometime, sometime way back, has described this as like the compromise versus ethics. So it's, uh, you have, compromise versus ethics means how do you reach a decision? Uh, you have to reach a decision, but you have to do it with others. So you may have to compromise to get the decision. How much do you water down your ethics to reach the decision you have to make? Actually, the, for anyone who ever needs to make a decision along with other people, I think that Max Weber, Politics as a Vocation, the Wikipedia summary is quite good. It's actually a good study. Um, my friends in this case didn't want there to be bad attractors in the Swedish society. They wanted not for there not to be tracking, but now that there was going to be tracking, they felt that they could be a good tracker. Like, but what is a good tracker, actually? Someone who... Uh, can be trusted not to use all the highly personal information about how citizens do or have to interact with governments for unpleasant things, that don't sell this information and so forth. Um, but if you have a big database and the government wants access to it, of course the government has access. So you cannot be a good tracker in the sense that you keep this information confidential. Um, choosing to be a good tracker will always mean that you are participating in the tracker. It's a compromise that you make with your anti-tracking ethics to ensure that there is an option which is less bad than other options that may exist. Um, but then again, if it's a bad system to run a government on, maybe one shouldn't compromise that way. The ethical thing to do is not to participate in the tracking um, and the tracing, because ultimately it's the tracking and the tracing in themselves uh, that are problematic. It's not the particular, hmm? it's not the particular um, uh, entity which is doing, uh, doing it. Um, so another thing that was funny in Sweden was actually that parliamentarians in the national parliament had been very clear about wanting the same, um, the, the same type of authentication system electronically and non-electronically. And so I thought, what, what does the same mean in this case? I have a national ID card from Sweden, and most people I show it to will, will remember it because my, my picture is very bad. It's really spectacularly bad. Uh, my mom told me I had to get a new ID card when she saw it. Uh, but, they, but they will not uh, remember exactly how it is bad. Um, so many people ask me to show it twice, for instance, because they don't remember the extent of the horror. Um, and the, so, um, or they extract only the information they require and then they forget. So uh, normally my ID card is only read by human agents. For all commercial transactions, when I buy tobacco, for instance, um, actually no information about me as such is stored. If you ask the shop attendants two hours, two hours later, chances are they will have already forgotten that even somebody authenticated themselves for a tobacco purchase not that long ago. So there's not really much tracing of the use of an ID card by a central authority. Um, electronically, it's much more difficult to ensure that there's no central agent tracing all the authentication that happens all the time. Um, humans also learn to recognize each other after some time. I can go to my dentist and they recognize my face, I don't have to ID myself. A computer clearly doesn't have this capability. If there's a server somewhere, I will need to authenticate myself in the same way all the time. It's not like the, the server at the other side will at some point learn that, oh, this is um, Amelia coming back. 
So um, a computer, when it is given information, additionally can't forget. If you, provide the informa if you provide information to a computer, you have to actively tell it to forget. And then you can hope that the information is not restorable afterwards. So um, any electronic and non-electronic authentication system would kind of, per definition, not be um, the same. But then, which sameness does one want? The same in that the, the privacy of the individual is somehow protected and the general institution of power balance, which has carefully been devised over hundreds of years, is protected, or um, the same in that access in general to the service should be protected under whatever, uh, or possible under whatever conditions. Uh, I don't think that the Swedish national parliamentarians had really thought very deeply about what they requested, uh, but it's strange because it's a very political issue how you balance power and information in a society. And this is exactly the type of thing that we would normally expect politicians to think about very carefully, but which very often they don't. What should society be like? Who should have what power over whom and when? How can that power be exercised? How do we ensure that abuses of power can be resolved? Um, so that is, um, uh, how do we solve conflicts that arise when somebody with power abuses it uh, with respect to somebody without power? Um, the Swedish example of the Identity Federation is really a beautiful story of how technology for public infrastructure was seen as some magical thing imaging that could not be anything other than possible. It's a story of technical naivete with respect to politics, and it's also political naivete with respect to technology. Nowhere in the entire process, four years, like four years of investigations, did anyone consider that a citizen's relationship with their public services and authorities is quite fundamental to the machinations of society. Um, but they should have, and especially the political layers of society should have in this case. Somebody at the government should have thought about this. Um, but so, um, uh, after I had ranted about this in Sweden for four months, uh, the technical people in Sweden decided that they didn't want to help me with the European uh, regulation anymore because uh, I tried to make the Swedish solution legal. Um, so uh, going back to the European level, I, I had decided to at least try and remedy these technical and political mistakes from Sweden, or in some form, like partially. Because we can make whatever changes we want in the text, um, I ended up putting something like 141 amendments in the regulation which has, which has only 40 articles. Um, so that is quite big um, changes, but it's very rare that the parliament follows these changes. Um, I was considering ways in which I could accomplish ethically and politically that which I wanted without changing too much, but actually the Commission's text was so, un so unconflictful and so non-political that it wasn't possible to do anything other than almost a complete rewrite. Um, it's been difficult to have that discussion in the Parliament with my colleagues afterwards, but I think I'm recognized as quite an eccentric character, and so um, I'm tolerated by my colleagues for, for doing these things to the Commission, which has also been very upset with me. Um, the thing is, um, it's quite obvious why we don't want random tech maintenance persons somewhere to be able to casually look up when or why we've been in contact with healthcare, for instance. Uh, or why we don't want all the information about how or what we do at school to be sold to advertisers so that they can more easily target people at their universities. Um, but the, the devil in this piece of legislation is in the details. When we got the proposal, it had no political aspect to it at all because the Commission had been looking to avoid some fights with the member states. Um, now, we're kind of, we haven't voted on this file yet in the Parliament, so I'm somehow now in the constant state of concern that by now we will have understood these problems on what are the power relationships in the governments, what's on linkability, what is data minimization and attribution-based credentials, um, and we have the politically, ethically, the system analysis done right, but we will not be able to make the technical language and the dossier also right. And so, because I haven't seen now the proposals that, um, for the texts that we will vote on yet, um, I'm um, uh, very nervous about that. And if you want to, because if you've made a set of moral and political choices, liability and risk and duties and obligations on the different parties in the system needs to be allocated kind of strictly for the system to work. And so it's, it's difficult and it's not obvious how one should do that. The European Parliament ultimately um, 
uh, isn't a technical institution, but a political institution. We don't have the resources that we need to overhaul uh, proposals like this, but the commission proposal was really spectacularly bad, and so they deserve this. Um, but so, what I think is that the um, electronic identification regulation, the way that we've been working with it in the parliament for the last year, is really something that we will have to do a lot more in the future. Um, so I think that we have a need for regulating network architectures and um, say what can a technology do, what can the technology do, what is it desirable for a technology to do in a particular circumstance. And it's an old discussion, and we've had it already in the late 1990s, the argument, do we need special cyber laws? This would be Lawrence Lessig in 1997, um, arguing that we need to tell the code what to do, because the code confines us to very specific actions, and so if we want to do something, we have to make sure that the code allows us to. Um, some people back then, and even now, argue that technology changes too quickly to be regulated, so it makes no sense to regulate. I think that this latter argument is a bit daft. Um, copyright law can be said to have regulated the internet since the internet emerged, for instance. It just takes some time to get the case law and the court cases, but the legislation as such was always there. And the same thing is with uh, online services like banking. A bank does not become unregulated only because it has some operations online. It's regulated in its activities as a bank, not through in the particular medium it uses for services. Um, we didn't see a lot of technical architecture regulation yet. Uh, the regulation that we're doing on electronic identification um, describes uh, the duties that fall on human agents behind the architecture or that operate the architecture. Uh, but as we've seen, for instance, over the last summer, um, human agents don't always act predictably or in a trustworthy way. And so we will have to ensure that we are able to make the technologies and the humans together work predictably and in a trustworthy manner. Um, oh yes. And so finally, Europe is going through a very big ordeal at this time. The legislation that I described is important for the reason that it could implement privacy by design obligations on some technical systems. Um, also describing what a uh, privacy by design obligation could be. Unlinkable transactions based on uh, anonymous authentication or attribution based credentials. Um, this is a sound principle to put in your institutional framework, but then you need to make sure that it's actually in the technical regulation. And uh, it would be better if the Commission were able to do that, or national governments, rather than leaving it up to the European Parliament to do it. Uh, but we have also a large discussion on the general data protection regulation. Uh, and this regulation is kind of much broader than the electronic identification regulation and very fundamental for how we, the European Union, as a union, will make our future. Um, it sets the framework for market operators, companies, governments, everyone on how we deal with data protection and privacy. And what we've seen in these discussions is that we have very, very heavy lobbying, especially American lobbying, and especially against strong privacy protection. And so I guess the Snowden affair would reveal to us the reason for why American companies are not so keen on privacy. Uh, but we also see that European governments are very unwilling to set the direction towards strong privacy protecting legal frameworks. That is why the Commission in the Electronic Identification Regulation isn't taking care of their own investments. We've made loads of investments in privacy-friendly technologies in Europe. Um, so uh, we would normally want to have a legal framework which makes it possible to use, those, uh, use the results of those research programs. It's worthwhile to look up more information on the General Data Protection Regulation because optimally we want to influence many things in the direction of, of more secure and more privacy-friendly technologies. Uh, one of the primary arguments against the regulation is that it would block innovation, but I think the European research programs in themselves show that there's a lot of innovation and a lot of thinking about privacy-friendly technologies that can still be, be done. Uh, and how to deal with privacy and data protection technically, I understand, is not actually a trivial problem, but often a very interesting one. So um, I'd like to finish off with, like, I hope many of you here today go out to become innovators and entrepreneurs that have the legal framework that you need to make the most out of such innovation and markets. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope that this was at least somewhat helpful in understanding also a political view of challenges around regulating and legislating um, technologies. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them.
uh, a little bit different, not totally in this subject, but uh, considering the recent uh, events that were published in media, um, do you, can you explain or tell a little bit more about um, the things that are being discussed in Europe for uh, espionage problems, etc.? Uh, well, I heard that the Commission is thinking about maybe cutting off the SWIFT agreement, but the problem is that the entire banking infrastructure relies on these data transfers taking place, and so if we cut the SWIFT agreement, to my understanding, we don't actually have the infrastructure to make international bank transfers, which is inconvenient. So the question is if we um, uh, are technically able to, to do that. When it comes generally to espionage issues, the European Union doesn't have national security competences, and it also doesn't have a military. Uh, but the member states do. And so looking at the general data protection regulation, how do we think about privacy frameworks for all of society, or, or even something like technical regulation, the electronic identification things, I wouldn't say that I'm seeing any strong and convinced push away from tracking, tracing, surveillance, mapping, and so forth. But I see a lot of resignation. So actually what I, in, in Sweden, this has been difficult for me to watch when journalists say that, yeah, we know that the NSA is tracking our sources, but actually they're not so interested in Sweden anyway, so it doesn't matter. And so, Journalists in Sweden have a constitutional obligation to protect their sources. The source decides if to be protected or not. And now journalists are saying that if the NSA violates that, it's not a big deal. But I think it's because people don't see that through a piece of legislation, like, for instance, the general data uh, protection regulation, or if we're able to make technical regulation like electronic identification, we can actually take society away from from the revelations of last summer, because it's very clear that also national security is a political decision somehow. You know, that it's not like we're ending up in this state of exception with mass surveillance because we didn't make political decisions to that effect. That means we can make political decisions to a different effect. The problem is how do you make both political people and technical people and citizens and all of these actors in society understand that? Because I think also a lot of politicians don't, and a lot of technical people don't un understand that, that politics is a very powerful tool. I go to my work every day and I say random things that affect 500 million people, which is a lot. It, I have a lot of power. And so how do you make the people in the parliament understand that they have this power? How do you make governments in member states understand that they have the power? It's not... Trivial. I'm working on it. Please help. You can have these uh, different websites that uh, uh, help you figure out what to do with the general data protection regulation. It's meant to set the framework where we can have privacy-friendly technologies and um, normally steer both markets and public authorities into uh, a more mature way of thinking on information technologies as, as a normal part of society rather than this exceptional state where no rules apply and there's no state of law. Does it make sense, the answer? No, but like really the general data protection regulation is very important. <laughs> the reason that I don't talk about it is because I am not working with it in the parliament. But it's very important and in general I think you should care. Sorry. Um. Uh, I'm interested in energy privacy, particularly uh, smart meters at the moment. Uh, they're being rolled out in a few different countries. Do you know much work on pets or smart meters or legislation either in Sweden or other countries? Well, smart meters is such an interesting problem. In Sweden we deployed 4.5 million of them in the country because we decided back in 2006 that the European Union had forced us to do that. Which is not true, because the European Union hasn't forced any other member states to do that, and it would be strange if the Union forced Sweden to do things that other member states weren't forced to do. Um, then the government and some probably IT security people, actually our national security agency realized, shit, oh shit, our entire electricity network is on the internet. 
and could potentially be very vulnerable to all of the other two billion people that are there. What are we going to do? Let's form a crisis group and allow the National Security Agency to monitor all of the communications with smart meters. And so I'm a bit irritated with this because I think, and this was explained to me only very recently, that the problem that we wanted to solve with smart meters is actually, um, um, we're expecting that in the world of renewable technologies, renewable energies, uh, we will have a variable supply of energy and therefore we need to have a variable demand. But the problem is most people and industries and so can't change their, de their uh, demand so much. You can't help that you need to eat at a given time of the day. It's difficult to wash in the middle of the night if you have kids. Uh, you're very confined to specific hours of the day. If you leave your fridge off for six hours every day to save energy, your food goes bad and you don't want that. So um, the smart, this smart meter technology seems not to be the best for supply, for solving the variable demand issue. And I am actually critical of whether smart meters at all are useful to have. Uh, it seems that somebody invented them in the late 1980s, then people figure out that there's big privacy problems around them. This was studied around 88, 89, but in the beginning of the 90s, some smart meter companies infiltrated Sense and Elect, which is a standardization organization for electricity network in the European Union. It's my hypothesis, right? And uh, they got very excited about this idea, and then they started lobbying for it to be deployed on a much larger society level, but actually they, they solve no problems, and they create a lot of problems. And so making pets for smart meters, sure, we can do that, but, but what is the point? I think probably we should be trying to solve the actual problem that we have in the electricity network, rather than um, thinking how to make the big problems that we've now introduced slightly uh, less big. Um, the smart meter issue is very, very interesting. Perfect example of how you start out with a problem, then you find the solution which doesn't fit your problem, so you use the solution to create a problem which you can solve through it, but the new problem was actually only created by the fact that you found an arbitrary solution. Yeah. Does it, I'm sorry, that was maybe not uh, the answer that you had wanted. No, that was a good, good answer, and I think useful for other people to know that these problems exist. Um, maybe if I was going to repeat a question for a more direct uh, answer, do you know of other countries that are doing work on, on privacy for smart meters? In Germany, well, so in Germany they've had a few pilot projects in electricity networks with broadcasting, which kind of completely bypasses the smart meter problem. Because if you're going to create a variable demand with the consumers, what you need is not actually for the consumer to communicate all of their consumption to the electricity provider. You need for the electricity provider to communicate towards the end consumer, for instance, the price. And so in Germany, they've tried uh, broadcasting prices to households and to uh, meters in households that aren't internet connected. Um, and that would therefore be able to make locally a decision based on the broadcasted information without making the smart meter vulnerable to, to networks. So that is, I mean, that is more privacy friendly, but probably has other security problems related to it with the broadcasting technologies and so on. In the Netherlands, they have also projects, I guess, but maybe they are the ones that you were thinking about because I've heard mostly about the Dutch projects. Um, in Sweden, I can tell you that this is completely absent from any consideration at all. Uh, we have a research group at Karlstad University that works on privacy and smart meters, but um, they're a research group and they take European research money and so aren't seen as legitimate stakeholders by the Swedish government, for instance, because they only trust stuff that they themselves sponsor, unlike the European Commission that doesn't trust the stuff that they sponsor. Uh, I have a kind of general question. Um, I think that the Roman Republic understood concrete rather well when they began constructing roads. It is becoming increasingly apparent to me that there is some brittleness in our technology stack. Is there any kind of uh, working group within either the Commission or the Parliament looking at uh, responses to some kind of black swan event. Does that make sense? 
I'm not sure that I understand the question, actually. As in, like, um, I think this summer we had some revelation largely because of mis like the type of Mr. Snowden revelation event, you mean? Or what kind of event would this be? I mean, uh, unplanned failure. I, I don't think so. I mean, that sounds kind of harsh to, to say, but um, I, don't, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe it was a dumb question. No. No, but it's like, yeah, we have groups that look at what happens if we get different types of problems. But, yeah. I'm not sure that there's the European normally militaries would do this kind of thing. I guess in the member states they have the Swedish crisis group for smart meters, for instance, is looking into what would happen if somebody closes down the entire Swedish electricity grid, uh, and that would be kind of a black swan event. I guess nobody expects that. Um, but then I don't think that this crisis group can do much many useful things about that. They can speculate that it would be bad if that happened, but but we didn't form a crisis group to we didn't need to form a crisis group to figure that out. And actually, um, uh, we're not clear, clearly not going to uh, mitigate the problem by, for instance, disconnecting smart meters. So, uh, the problem in many political institutions, and I guess in the European Union, also in the member states, is that uh, we can understand that there could be problems, uh, but we don't have the desire to solve them. Uh, I have a question regarding the e-government and like design and technical requirements, regulations, and so on. It's, it seems a bit interesting to me that there are actually people in the you know European Union or, or politicians, maybe or say uh, legislation people that try to define the technical requirements or try to define how an app or where a certain database needs to sit or what identity provider or whatever needs to be. Right? I mean, on this kind of technical level, like an architectural level, why is that the right place to? Stuff, or why is that the right place to talk about? Couldn't you like? I thought it was kind of a solved problem that there are like a IT security crypto professors or something that can give you like the perfect thing. They can give, you know, you ask them, hey, our country is interested in privacy uh, friendly e-government. Give me a system, and they give you like a disk or something that's solved. Like I thought that was kind of the case. So it's really interesting that this is still. I don't know. I thought no government wants this privacy. That's why we don't have them. Like, if they want them, aren't, is this a solved problem? Well, I mean, as you clearly see from the Swedish case, um, no, they don't want privacy-friendly technologies in general. In Germany and, I guess, also Belgium, uh, many Central Eastern European countries, they're using smart card companies because smart card companies lobbied well back some, some time ago. And so the smart card industry tried to lobby on the uh, EID regulation also, but um, unsuccessfully so. Not because of me, because of them. Um, and so, why do you need why do you need to establish in law how society should work with respect to the interactions between citizens and the government? The reason you regulate this in law is because you're not talking here about the technical system as such. You're also talking about the mode of interaction. And so, why would you set down the technical requirements um, in? in the law, th this is the 1990s discussion. Do we regulate the architecture or don't we regulate the architecture? And I would clearly say that we do. I would agree. I mean, you can regulate it, but shouldn't that, like how you do it and how the system needs to look and how the actual like, technical stuff needs to be regulated, shouldn't that be decided by the actual implementers or the designers? I mean, yeah, but the problem is in Sweden then, what you had was a technical guy at the university who had a system that he liked, that he could manage. And he goes, I like my system and I trust myself. Therefore, everybody else in all of Sweden will also like my system and trust me. And so, because technical people have sometimes, and in Sweden I realized this, complete naivete with respect to institutional systems, I think it's very good that we put the political decisions on how the institutional power balance in society is built with politicians. Because there is a reason that politicians and technical people often don't overlap. This is. Um, some of these things we, we need to decide politically. Not every technical architectural choice is a purely technical choice. And it's actually quite a big problem now that we have, if we want privacy, 
protection in society. We don't want this NSA state of exception, complete surveillance all the time. We need to set a political direction away from that because these decisions aren't taken by technical, it's not technical what the NSA is doing primarily, it's political. Um, so I, I think that this is, that, uh, my, my confidence for technical people actually had a quite bad blow in Sweden because of this. Um, I was surprised at the like, genuine stupidity of their reasoning. Um, I, guess, I guess maybe you chose the wrong people. Well, I didn't choose it's, it's them. I, I didn't choose them. I think that they were just conveniently located close to somebody yeah, in the government true. that didn't think about the fact that they were making uh, an institutional choice. It's kind of a unique situation, I guess. It's, it's a poorly understood question, both politically and, um, and technically, I think. The, yeah. But you can go back and read, like, Lawrence, Lawrence Lessig, quote from 1997, would be an argument in favor of my position. And there's people also who argue against against that, but I might have difficulty seeing how else we would solve. Okay, we have time for one more question. No, hi. It, you mentioned that uh, the German government has this um, this way of uh, uh, that prevents from correlating data between, uh, let's say, your medical records and uh, your financial records. So, do you see this as uh, an ideal, or at least uh, close to the, an, an ideal way of, of really achieving some some sort of control without uh, compromising privacy? I mean, for do you see this as a framework that can work for other countries, or, or what would be your proposal? I mean, uh, to still achieve some kind of let's say control over uh, citizen data without compromising uh, privacy to the level that. Mm. Well, the German constitution is quite cleverly written and the German constitution it, is written with the particular goal in mind not to get Nazi Germany, basically. So the German constitution works very well, the constitutional framework, the constitutional court normally, um, as far as I understand, makes the right calls with respect to institutional power balance. And so would that be a good kind of model framework for some technical systems? I think yes. Um, if, if you're looking for balancing institutional power, looking to the German system for inspiration isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and as we're becoming more interconnected, um, it's also becoming increasingly important for us to think about ways in which we can create this German unlinkability concept. So in Sweden, it's really difficult even to explain unlinkability, like why it would be necessary not to interlink databases all the time. Uh, and so, but the German example then is, is very helpful also politically because it has a clear political rationale and it's a clear constitutional kind of institutional structure. Thanks. So, thank you. Well, the next speaker is Nols. Uh, there's a few announcements that we want to make. Uh, first of all, for those people who snuck in during the talk, um, it's strictly forbidden to bring uh, drinks or food in this room. And uh, for the people who are going to do a lightning talk, um, there are USB uh, 